Thank you, uh, <laughs> little transition, but yeah, thank you uh, so much for coming down today. It means a lot to sit here and discuss with you about your son, Jack. Um, for those of who don't know, just tell us a little bit about Jack and or who it is you lost and what that means to you. So, Jack Harry Morgan was born on the 1st of February 1997. 1st of Feb? That's the same birthday as me. And we didn't even know no, that? No, didn't know that. Crazy. I'm so, the 28th, if anyone. Or Feb. I was, wondering, yeah. I was going to ask you when you're born. <laughs> yeah, Thank 28th. You. And you? Uh, 6th of Jan. Okay. 19th of Jan. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jack was my eldest of four. And went on holiday with his girlfriend around about August 17. He was probably the fittest he'd ever been. Yeah. And from a mental health and well-being perspective, also in a really good place. Yeah. They went to Mexico. And while he was away, his right eye started watering. And he came home and he rang his mum. And she said, look, just, just monitor it, just keep an eye on it. And it, it got progressively worse. And he, he went to see a GP in Bristol. And the GP told him that he had blepharitis, which is like an eczema of the eye. Yeah. Gave him some ointment and said, come back in six weeks. And rang Emma, my wife, and said, this is bullshit. I know my own body. Yeah. I don't have eczema of the eye. I'd like you to get me an appointment in town now. So Emma made the appointment, and to cut a very long story short, after a number of consultations, it transpired that he had a tumour. They called it an undifferentiated carcinoma, which meant they really didn't know what it was. Yeah. And by the time he'd been diagnosed, he already had lumps in his neck. Yeah. And almost immediately was admitted into hospital, had four rounds of chemotherapy, had six weeks of daily radiotherapy, and was given the all clear come February 18 and built himself back up. Jack yeah. was a big gym freak. Yeah. And went on a holiday. Yeah. Went to Australia, jumped out of an aeroplane, well, actually yeah. a helicopter, and lived his best life. Yeah. We've got family who live in Sydney and in Byron, and he went to visit them. And went back to uni. And this is now towards the end of 2018. He's in the gym. He's home for Christmas. And he's got a pain in his, in his back. Yeah. And it transpired that the uh, cancer had returned into both lungs. Yeah. And we lost him August 26th, 2019. So I'm talking to you now and it's, it's just been over a year. I actually want to bring you up on that because um, I did see the other day that, you know, it had been a year since Jack passed. And I mean, I lost mum, not, not a similar time, but it was a couple a couple months later. And one thing I've really realised, this year has gone so quickly. Like, you know, it feels like yesterday that I was sitting down having a conversation with her on the beach with her, you know, well, in my eyes, her health was, you know, she was fully there and... The fact that a year has passed, I it, it's just it's so hard to like believe. It's like the, you know she's no longer around, and it's just like so much has changed in this year. And you know I, I want to reach out to, her, I want to hold her hand, but there's just so much that I feel her like you know even in, even though it's been a year and you know your your passing was a lot um, was further or oh, it's been longer, but. It, you know, I, I do feel quite distant from her at the minute, sort of thing. It's interesting, you've touched on, on, on two points here. One, the length of time. Yeah. And two, her material absence. Yeah. So, the question I get asked a lot is, how do you cope? 
and I have I have a coping mechanism. Yeah. Which I'd like to discuss with you. Because we've discussed this amongst ourselves that grief is not prescriptive. Definitely not. And the relationship I had with Jack might have been different and probably was different to the relationship that Emma had with him. Yeah. And and that Joshua had with him and Charlotte and Sam. Yeah. So it's not prescriptive and our coping mechanisms are very different as well. Now, I am not a religious person. I do not believe in an, in an invisible deity and a God, but I am spiritual. Yeah. And I believe with every fibre of my being and I have nothing to support this, no. which I guess is the essence of faith. I believe with every fibre of my being that Jack is in another room and I can't see him and I can't touch him but I know one day that door will be opened to me and I will be re reunited with him yeah and because I believe this so strongly I don't just believe it I know it yeah. it's a certainty it's a certainty for me that gets me through every single day. People say, ask me if I'm depressed. Yeah, which isn't a helpful question in general. It's, uh, people don't know what to say, Joe. Yeah. And it's, it's not a helpful question, but I'm not depressed. If I was depressed, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. I wouldn't be able no. to function. There's a deep-rooted sadness and darkness yeah. inside me. Of course. That yeah. we all have. But I'm able to function by virtue of that deep-rooted knowledge that yeah. I will see him again. I might be allowed another 12 hours on this planet, or yeah. I might be given another 40 hours on this planet, but in the time continuum, it's not a long time. No. So I know that I will see him again. So when we talk about the physical absence, yeah. that's, how I deal, yeah. that's how I deal with that. So before you said you don't think um, grief is like a prescribed thing, so everyone deals with it differently. So... Do you kind of find it maybe difficult because maybe your wife or your kids don't have that kind of same belief? Or do you all kind of share that? And It's a brilliant question. It's a brilliant question. Um, he's not the elephant in the room. Yeah. We, yeah. we talk about him a lot, both anecdotally, where we'll um, discuss the great times and the good times and the achievements... Yeah. But also, we'll discuss, not as much, but the impact he's, he's had yeah. on us. Yeah. And he continues to have on us. And I respect that my wife and my kids deal with it differently to the way I do. Yeah. And as long as they respect the same of me, then we're united. Yeah. Yeah. As long as the way we each behave doesn't impact on the other. Yeah. Adversely or negatively. Yeah. Then we're, then we're fine. I'm at my happiest when I'm talking about Jack yeah. Morgan. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with you. And I think initially it took me a while to come to terms with that because we were all responding to my loss in different ways. And, you know, I, um, I, I, you know, I wanted to talk about mum all the time, but I noticed if I brought her up, there was like this eerie sadness. And the way I dealt with it, like you said, was very different to different to how my brother coped and how my brother dealt with it. And, you know, at the time I was, you know, I saw it and I was like, I don't understand. Why, why are we not all on the same page? We lost the same person. Surely yeah. we should all um, behave and act in the same way. But that's the thing with grief. And that's the thing with loss. You know, each everyone has a different relationship everyone has a different set of feelings that you you have towards this person and yeah. it took me a while for my, for me to really understand that everyone handles grief differently and doesn't there's no right or wrong way there's no there's no you know set of rules and not a grief rule book that you need to follow it's it, it happens and you know the way you deal with it you find out what works for you and you find out how best to you know cope with what what you're going through and you know whether that be talking about it or that might be um just getting up picking yourself up and getting on with your life and I think it's just important to realize that yeah every no one responds the same way and that's okay yeah and I, I think something that I I want to advocate is that 
grief doesn't go away because of because time has passed. So in in March it will be eight years since my dad passed away. Wow. And genuinely, I feel exactly the same. But yet people are more inclined not to ask yeah. me a question purely because more time has passed. So it's like, oh, you know, eight years has passed. Kim's getting on with it. But it's not that. It's that I have to get on with it. Do you feel that that dad-shaped hole hasn't dissipated? You've just learned to grow around it. Is yeah, that what you're saying? Precisely. It's that the void doesn't go, but because it's there and life continues, you have to evolve with it. And I mean, I said this to Joe when we first spoke. My dad passed away, I was 16. I'm 23 now. I am a complete different person. And that breaks my heart the most because yeah. it's like he didn't really know who I was. And that's something that really kind of clouds me every day because it's like, how can he be proud of me if he didn't, he doesn't know who I am? No, he does. Of course he does. Uh, he really does. I'd like to believe so, but then there's kind of hints of doubt, you know, because he's not here. But then I also do share your view that I will see him again. And yeah. that does give me comfort. And I don't want to be judged for holding that view. And I wouldn't ever judge anyone for no. holding a different view. No. Of course. Um, in fact, if you told me that this, this beautiful figurine that sat in your dad's surgery gets you through every day, I'd say, Kim, fill your boots. Because it's no different in believing in an invisible God. If that's your coping mechanism. I wrote a poem called The Road Not Travelled as part of uh, Be More Jack Day, which we can talk about in a moment. Yeah. And it's exactly that. You don't, you don't miss the time necessarily that you had with the person who passed. Of course, no. you, you miss them and everything about them. Yeah. But it's the milestones. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that are about to, that you're about to witness and you're about to enjoy. That's, that's what you miss. It's, yeah. the time, it's that road not travelled, the time you're not going to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I do want to actually quickly touch upon something. Um, and, you know, the fact that you are, you know, you're, you're a father and, you know, I, I, I've spoken about this with my grandma and it's, you know, there's, there's not a word for someone who loses a child. And, you know, when you, you lose a, a parent, you're an orphan. If you lose a, a, a husband or wife, you, you're a widow. But there isn't a word, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there isn't a word if you, if you lose a child. And I think it's very good looking. I think that's the, the phrase you use. Yeah, I mean, you are great looking. <laughs> Carry on. But yeah, no, I think as, as, the, as the parent, how did you initially respond to Jack's passing? Did you... Wow, what a question. So Jack was diagnosed in the October 17. Yeah. And a very, very dear friend of mine said to me only a few weeks ago that Jack felt, and he knows because he had a very candid conversation with Jack towards the end, Jack felt that I took two years out of my life. Jack never had this conversation with me, but he had it with yeah. him. And I don't feel that's true at all. I felt privileged to go on that journey yeah. with him. And I felt it's, I believe it's made me the man that I am today. Yeah. So I didn't really take time to take stock of what was happening. I accepted what was happening to my eldest son. Yeah. And I was there to love and support him, as was my wife and as were my, my kids, to support him through that journey. And... Your question is a great one. How do you balance? How do you balance it in your life that you've lost your child? Because we know that it's not, it's not the way of things. No. Okay. We lose our grandparents. We lose our parents. 
we don't bury our children. No. It's not the way. You wanted a lot longer with your dad, you wanted a lot longer with your mum, and I certainly wanted yeah. the rest of my life with Jack. Yeah. But it wasn't to be for whatever reason. I do believe that I'll be, a mate, I'll be made aware why at some point, just not now. Okay. So I've never really taken a step back, Joe, and yeah. considered myself in all of this. Yeah. Because it was, it's always been about Jack. Yeah. He also taught us of something called a survivor's obligation. I don't know if you've heard of this phrase. Yeah. I have because um, my friend Mika mm. feels it because of Jack. Um, yeah. So survivor's obligation, for those who don't know, is cancer patients who survive cancer feel guilt that they survived whereas others didn't. Yeah. And Jack talked about and wrote about the survivor's obligation and he placed it on us. So he has now passed and the obligation is on us to live our best lives. Yeah. To be the best versions of ourselves that we can be, which is why I'm not depressed. Yeah. Which is why I get out of bed every morning yeah. to be the best ver version of myself that I can be. I find that incredibly interesting because I, I didn't, I didn't fully know the term for it. I mean, I saw one of Jack's posts and then I researched it, um, what it actually meant. And my, you know, where, since mum's passed, my whole perspective on life, my whole, the idea that life is it's incredibly short. And I know I've touched upon this with you, but as long as I'm around and as long as I'm here, I have ev I have the obligation to you know, live life and do whatever, you know, I want to do. There's no, there's no point whether that, you know, be the best person, like you said, whether that's, you know, being kinder or developing, if that means going for that job that, and I was holding myself back for or whatever, because I'm around and I have, I don't think it's a guilt. I don't, I don't feel guilty, but I think it, it's a weird way of looking at it. But the only thing I can take from mum's passing is the fact that I now have, it's it's given me this added motivation to like push myself and really just live live a life that well that she would have wanted that, yeah, yeah that she would have wanted for me and I didn't I didn't know the the term survivor's obligation but um I I do think when mum was alive and you know she had cancer for well on and off for for eleven years nearly and mm. she lived each day you know with you know to the utmost potential she lived each day to the fullest whether that's you know just you know she i think something inherently clicks in your mind when you know when you've you face death and you've seen death and you mm. it knocks on your door and she had this this mentality that this was you know this is her life and even a couple of weeks before um she passed we were in israel and we were at this this wedding in Israel and you know mum was really really ill at this point and I I didn't I, I I you know I saw her you know she was thin and and she she didn't look herself but I did it didn't it didn't trigger anything I just I'd seen how treatment had had responded to her and I just thought I didn't think too much of it and there was this this, this night she was really really ill the night of the this this wedding and the the three kids myself my brother my sister we were like oh mom please come to the wedding like come on it'll be it'll be nice it would be you know we really want you there and you know she was in bed like frail and in the space of three minutes she picked herself up put makeup on looked the best she's ever looked I mean it's that picture up there and she she went to this wedding um when you know she had an IV dripping that morning she was you know she was not in any shape or form to be to be going to this wedding but she, because she saw you know she didn't whether she knew this her life was coming to an end she just had this this mentality i'm going to do this and not just for me but also for my kids and i think that is something i'm going to hold on to you know that the idea that it's you know the, the power and the um the strength she had I think that's because, and I've got, again, nothing to support this, that the strongest of us can be afflicted the worst. Yeah. yeah. Because 
whether it's your dad, your mum, Jack, they have something in their DNA, they have something in their makeup, they have something that drives them yeah. over and above what is normal. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, and it's not widely known, but a few hours before Jack passed, he said, I need to reset. They were his exact words, I need to reset. Yeah. And that, that word, that phrase, reset, that word reset is banded around a lot at the moment because of COVID and yeah. we need to be a bit nicer and a bit kinder. And maybe before we all pass, we're, we're given wisdom because it's yeah. a really wise thing to say is yeah. that I need to reset, mm. I need to start again. Yeah. And I noticed that you use the phrase past yeah. that your mum passed yeah which is the phrase i use for jack what do you use for your dad do you do you say your dad died or do you use the word past i think i prefer to say pass but i mean some people will say you know when did your dad die so i mean i i will answer them and i think i have i am aware that that is what it is but for me if I was to, if I said to you, my dad passed, that is what I, how I would like to phrase it. Yeah, and I noticed that you did as well. And I will only use the word past yeah. because for me, he hasn't died. No. That's hugely final. And for me, it's not final. And I take comfort in the word past and it actually jars with me when yeah. I hear the D word. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean... I, I, I do, I mean, I will say she died, like you said, but yeah. I think what you, you touched upon just there is, you know, she her, her physical presence isn't around, but her... I'm going to just quickly check that because I just heard. Okay. Uh, yeah. We all good? Yeah, yeah, all good, all good. Uh... Yeah, so her physical presence isn't around, but the I I'm struggling to think of the word, and this happens a lot. Spiritual or whatever, whatever it is, I you know I sometimes I've spoken again um, to Kim about this, but I find sometimes I see feathers, and you know before these these white feathers had no meaning, and they were just just uh, an object, you know they they were just something that was there. Now, whenever I see a white feather, I, I like to think that that's mum's way of guiding me and yeah. pushing me in the right direction and still nurturing from wherever she is. She's, she, she's, she's still being the loving, you know, the Jewish mother that she is, wanting the best for her son. And yeah. that is, I find real comfort in in. in in seeing these white feathers. So I, have a, so I have a couple of stories to that point. The first one is I'm a great believer that, that anyone who's passed can't come and visit us on this plane. Just believe they can't. So when we dream about them, it's us visiting them wherever they are. Yeah. I believe that the brain functions better when we're asleep. Um, we can't dream about our loved ones every day. If we, if we could, we would, because we all think about them on a yeah. regular, yeah. maybe us by minute, you by hour, and I understand that time does heal, but it's still, yeah. but it's still yesterday that it happened yeah. in your mind. I don't think it's time that heals. I think because time is progressive... You just have no choice but to deal right with it, and because it's been a longer chunk of time, I I don't want to say I'm more equipped, but I've dealt with it longer, so it's more kind of innate. Like I know what I I've dealt with it for eight years, so it I'm kind of used to it in a sense. Okay, okay, I get that. So I've had two dreams, three dreams about Jack. One of them I'm going to tell you about, and then I'd like to tell you something that happened that aligns with your feather story. Um, my daughter Charlotte is getting married and we're in an old house that we used to live in. Oh, yeah, is this in the dream? This is in the dream. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's, I, was, I didn't know about that. Charlotte Morgan is not getting married. <laughs> I was like, 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 I was like,
So in my dream, Charlotte's getting married, beautiful wedding dress, Emma's fussing around her, Josh is messing about with a bow tie, Sam's putting some shoes on, all in their dinner suits. I'm dinner suited up and we're leaving the house. And as we're leaving the house, I can hear Dad. And it's Jack. Yeah. And I look round and he's in this beautiful carver chair with a, his beautiful smile, looking great, suited and booted. And I look him in the eye. I say, what are you doing here? And with the most beautiful grin, he says, Dad, I'm always here. And I woke up with a great sense of comfort yeah. because I believe that's the closest I'm going to get on this plane to having a conversation with him. There was another moment that I'd like to tell you about, and that was Jack was treated at the Royal Marsden in uh, Kensington. Yeah. And we did that journey a lot. And I do remember on one of his last visits, I looked at him and he was thin and he was pained. And I knew that I would be doing this journey without him at some point. Yeah. This actual journey, I'd be in my car yeah. in this part of London. And a few months after he passed, I'm in my car in that part of London. And I, and I spoke to him out loud and I said, you don't know this, Jack, but I knew we'd be here and that you wouldn't be sitting next to me. I said, give me a sign. Give me a sign that you can hear me. And I think I was waiting for the heavens to open or a tree to fall or yeah. something. Nothing. So I just said, oh, thanks. <laughs> and Cheers, I, Jack. And I, and I drive along and I just, put my, I just put my Spotify on random, not even on a playlist, because yeah. I've got a number of playlists together that remind me of him or tracks that he particularly liked. And um, Every Breath You Take came on. I like that song. Now, I love that song. It is one of my favourite songs. And Jack and I would always have a bit of a debate about this song. Yeah. And he would say, oh, it's your favourite song. And I'd say, look, Jack, it, it's one of my favourite songs, but it's not my favourite song. And my favourite song is a song by a group called Train called Drops of Jupiter. And it was a good enough sign for me. Yeah. The next song that came on was Drops of Jupiter by Train. That's amazing. Wow. And I said, thanks. You hurt me. I think um, it's actually funny you say that because something quite similar happened to me. Um, I wasn't particularly looking for a sign or I wasn't you know, asking for anything to happen. But I think that's, that's the beauty of it. It comes when yeah. you need it most. And I, I think I, was, I wasn't having a great day. Um, you know, thing, life, well, not life wasn't great, but I just wasn't, you know, having my best of times. And I was like, all right, what do I, what should I do? So I put some, I put my headphones in, started listening to music and I shuffled. Like, it was weird because this wasn't a playlist I usually use. I, I just found a random playlist on Spotify and I just shuffled it because like my brain was frazzled. I couldn't, just, I couldn't think like I'm a stress head. So usually I'm like, oh, I don't know what playlist to watch, listen to, watch. And um, this particular day, really I just, frazzled. Yeah. <laughs> and this particular, this day, I just found a random <coughs> playlist and I shuffled it. And the first song that came up was Dancing Queen. And Wow. Because I know the room, yeah. it's your family. And for song. those of you who know my mum, she, you know, this, that was her song. She was the dancing queen. And that's something we like to, to, well, mention every day if, <laughs> for those who want to listen. But yeah, and the fact that this, this song came up, and I don't think I've ever heard it on my playlist in the last five years. But the fact that it came up and I was like, wow, like, I am not, I'm not a particularly a spiritual person. But the fact that these signs are there, it's hard not to, yeah. it's hard not to, see life from that perspective um slight change of topic though i mean yeah. that's tends to happen with these chats my brain before before you oh, do okay, yeah. sorry i just i would like to ask something that we did touch on a bit earlier um both of you can answer actually um but i i am sometimes someone sorry who believes that because of what we've been through it's okay to feel sad and I know you said you're not depressed, you want to, you know, make the most of every day. But 
do you also accept that because of what you're dealing with and because of what you've gone through, it is okay to feel that way sometimes? Uh, yes, it is. I, um, I said earlier that losing Jack has shaped me as a human being. Even pre-diagnosis, uh, I tried not to sweat the small stuff, something I didn't have time to do once Jack was diagnosed. I keep all negativity out of my life. And I lead quite a calm existence. Yeah. I don't shout, I don't scream, I don't lose my temper. I know that there is a solution to every challenge. There's no solution to the biggest challenge I have because as a parent, it's your job to fix things and I can't fix Jack. And I accept that. I know he's not walking through that door. Yeah. I'm not deluded. I know that. Yeah. And yes... It is okay to feel sad. I mean, I made a, a joke earlier and I diffuse a lot through comedy. Yeah. Wh whether, it, whether it's dark comedy, whether it's surreal, whether it's just telling jokes. And that's how I deflect, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yes, I totally accept that it's fine to feel sad. It's fine to feel shit. But equally, it's okay to talk about those emotions, yeah. to talk about the days when you're feeling low, to talk about the days when maybe I just can't get up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And invariably we are surrounded by people who love us and accept that. And therefore we should all be able to talk to them yeah. about those moments. Yeah. So how do you, how do you feel about talking about the days when you are shit, when you are low, when you can't cope? Um, well, I'm actually quite open with my emotions and I think that was definitely something I have found comfort in. I think, you know, for, for a long time I used to, like most stiff, you know, the stiff upper lip, the British culture, I wouldn't really discuss my emotions being a guy and like, oh, I'm, you know, so I, and then gradually I kind of, you know, with, you know, anxiety and just what was going on with mum, I kind of gradually started talking about my emotions. And when mum did pass, I knew that was the key to my, the key to my grief. I knew by discussing mum and by discussing what I'm experiencing, it sort of, it, it just allowed me to get all the shit that's here, all the, the negative jigsaw that is my brain all the just the confusion it allows me to somewhat rationalize and not come to terms because i'm i'm never going to come to terms with her loss you know i'm yeah. never going to just you know be... it's not something that you can just accept yeah. and move on with yeah i, I know they you'll say you'll never come to terms with it you'll never accept it no i think like kim said you you'll get to deal with it yeah later. Yeah, and I think that, like you said, I think with time, I mean, it, it has only been a year, but during that period, I have, you know, I've we've experienced many milestones, like your first Christmas, which yeah. was a nightmare, by the way, because it it was like two months after her passing, mm. and it was just like all oh, the family was together and everyone was just sit, sitting at the table trying to, you know, crack jokes and, you know, make sure that... Yeah. But like, it was on everyone's mind. We're all thinking there's a chair there that no one's sitting in. Yeah. And, that you know, she should be there. And so, yeah, milestones are the hardest. Um, but I think, like, you, with time and, you know, now I've got the, her first birthday out of the way and I don't want to say out of the way, like it's a, a, yeah. a chore, but at the time it, it's hard. Um, first birthday, first Mother's Day, um, coming up to her years passing, and each each little milestone, as hard as they are, it's it's a little. It gives it's like okay, I've done this now. I can I can, you know, I'm not I'm not in bed anymore. I'm not like I can still pick myself up and be okay because. Do Do you feel? that you um, you put up a wall or you wear a veneer or you smile for the camera. Of course. Do you, do you feel course. you do that on a regular basis? I think that's natural, though. I think, you know, 
yes, I'm willing to discuss what I'm experiencing. And I, I'm not speaking for both of you, but I know it. It, I, it, you can find comfort in discussing, well, especially like you said, discussing Jack or talking about my mum. There is a, you know, I, I, I have a smile on my face when I hear friends say, oh, your mother was amazing or whatever. It, yeah. It, but, you know, there is, there is an element of me who, you know, I can't go about life having this, this the sadness that I feel inside. I can't you know always show it and maybe that is you know it's not a great thing to do but yeah I do put a little front up what about yourself is that so just to your point about how how you feel when people tell you what a wonderful human being your mum was I get I get proud when I hear how Jack affected others I have yeah. I have people approaching me uh, of my age who who I don't necessarily know who, who tell me that they follow Jack's journey through Instagram yeah. and how through his learnings and his education and the power of his soul how they've changed the way they live their lives yeah. um, he had maybe 30,000 people hanging on his every word at its peak yeah and he was talking to people in Mexico and he's talking to people in Australia. And even though he was the one with the illness, he was sort of preaching a gospel to them. Yeah. And even now, because I still have his phone, yeah. because I post occasionally milestones, whether it be yeah. getting his degree or on a year of his passing, if there's something to communicate with his audience, I will. Yeah. And it's always about Jack. It's never about me. It's never about the family. It's always about Jack. And the responses we get from people we've we've never met before saying, you have no idea the impact that Jack yeah. had on our lives and still continues to have from people we've never met. That's proud of them. Yeah. Any GCSE, A-level yeah. degrees. Yeah. I mean, I do want to actually speak about his his social media and... You know, I, I didn't know Jack all that well. I, you know, I saw him a few times in the gym because, like you said, he was a big gym goer. And I did see him a few times in the gym. But one thing I do want to say is, you know, whenever I saw him or whether that is on social media, he always had a smile on his face. And, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's the fact that, you know, when you are... It was like he, he had so many demons and so much internal... like. Pain. Pain. pain and he had this this unbelievable smile that not only just comforted everyone around him because it was never about him he had this stoicity about him that it was never about him now maybe that was maybe that was his veil yeah. maybe that was his veneer so he didn't have to deal with it so he could make it all about you yeah and the sense i have is that he wanted to make people feel good about themselves yes yeah. Uh, which is a is a Remarkable. wonderful it's yeah. a wonderful trait, and yeah, that smile, that's how that's how I want to remember him. I struggle at the moment, going down a bit of a rabbit hole. If I think of him ill, my wife has an ability to compartmentalize that and only think about him well. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I will take myself to very dark places every consultation. Yeah. Every trip to chemo every trip to radio every yeah. overnight stay every cocktail of drugs that we had to administer um, seeing seeing him debilitate in front of our very eyes to become what he became at the end even talking about it now and being really graphic in my description of that and that I need a coping mechanism to stop that and I recognise that yeah. I do I, but yeah. I think I do too I, I still think about the the day prior to when my dad passed away and we went to see him in the hospital and honestly it was like looking at half a person. Yeah. And that genuinely does still kind of plague me. And I, do, I don't think that ever goes away, unfortunately, but I, I do think that you can learn to cope with it through remembering how remarkable he was and all the people yeah. that he's touched. Because 
I I wasn't friends with Jack. He he's my he was my age, but I know that he really was a wonderful person and even though we do have these horrible images kind of ingrained in our minds it it is so important to remember who they were before they were kind of struck with cancer and whatnot i mean jack touched so many some we can talk about some we can't <laughs> <laughs> um and i wasn't fully aware of how many lives he'd changed until he yeah. passed. You wanted to change the subject. No, it's actually yeah, it's gone out of my mind. To be keep going. Sorry, it's, that was my it's, bad. It tends to happen. <laughs> these chats, it's just that's well the beauty of talking about this kind of thing. It's like so much is brought up, and there's so much to talk about. Yeah, um, and that's why I think these talks are important, but. Um, you were under Sonic before I went on a little ramble, so I can't, I can't remember. But I know that you guys want to normalise the conversations around cancer. So Jack became very close with. Um, Keep talking. I'm just going to again. Sorry. No, it's fine. Is... Let's wait till it's. Oh, the battery's gone. Is that one still good? This one's low, but I mean we're on the last 10, 15 minutes of the podcast, so I think it should be alright. Okay, fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I, I pressed it immediately after it. Okay, fine. Sweet. Should we carry on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I know that you guys want to normalise the conversation around cancer, um, and Jack became very, very close with someone who's now very close to me, uh, a young lady by the name of Lauren Marn. And Lauren uh, is a cancer survivor herself. Is this uh, Girl Versus Cancer? Yeah, so she runs the podcast on the BBC called Girl Versus Cancer. Um... She set it up with Deborah James and with Rachel, who tragically lost her life before Jack. And it affected Jack greatly, actually. Yeah. Um, because I guess at that point you question your own mortality if you're struck with the same illness that somebody else has that's, yeah. that's not managed to fight the good fight. Um, and Lauren... Um, Lauren was really important in Jack's life and she's become really important in our lives. And I'm wearing, I'm wearing one of her collection, which she established for Jack. And on it, uh, you can see on the front on the back, yeah. it's his favourite his favorite mantra, which was, I haven't come this far to only come yeah. this far. And we live... We live our lives by that mantra. It dovetails into living your best life, yeah, survivor's sure. obligation, being the best person you can be. And Jack continues to drive us on in that, in that phrase. So Lauren launched her collection um, on his birthday, 1st of February last year. Um, sorry, COVID has frazzled my brain. 1st of February this year. I forget that we're still in... 2020 <laughs> yeah. and the essence behind Be More Jack is to just be a bit nicer be yeah. a bit kinder um, and lots of pledges were made the idea behind the day was to pledge to do something that ordinarily you wouldn't do yeah. to help others to better yourself so Jack was a beautiful pianist and he spoke beautiful Spanish so my wife's pledge was to learn Spanish and to learn piano to the things that she's doing now. Amazing. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. I pledged to offer my services in a homeless shelter. Um, yeah. Which was a great pledge to make just before COVID. And the homeless has been a cause close to my heart yeah. all yeah. my life. And I've supported at street level and also through community. And yeah. that's something that I want to do once I'm allowed to go back into yeah. the yeah, shelters. For sure. um, so if it wasn't for Lauren, we wouldn't have... Be More Jack Day, which is going to happen every year. Yeah. And uh, hopefully it's just made people sit up and think. Um, Jack never really cared what you had. I guess a bit like us, he was never about the material. He didn't care about who you knew yeah. or what you had. He cared about who you were. Yeah. And I think that's what Be More Jack's all about. Just yeah. The you know the kindness and sharing your love and your kindness 
Um, yeah, one thing I do want to say is I know I asked you to bring a few um, few things. Is it all right if we can just sure. talk about it? Sure. So um, I'd like to start with this this drawing of Jack by the fantastic Emily Green. Amazing. Um, this is a this is a pencil drawing from a photo, and it's its pride of place in our kitchen. Yeah. Um, I do this to it every time I pass it. Um, I don't kiss it. I kiss lots of photographs of him, but I don't kiss this. Yeah. And it gives me a lot of comfort because it's amazing. I can I can see his inner soul. Yeah. In this picture. Yeah. Um. I also that, that's the smile I was talking about. Yeah, it's captured his smile beautifully. Yeah. Um, if we talk about Kim's figurine, yeah. Jack was a big collector of Japanese figurines, yeah. of art, contemporary. Um, so his favourite artist was uh, Romero Brito. Yeah. And this is a Disney Brito collaboration. Um, but he was also a, a huge cause fan. Yeah. Not the Irish family group. <laughs> and this is a figurine that still sits above his cabinet in his in his bedroom. I want to actually... You said bedroom and that triggered something in me. Um, have you changed up his bedroom or have you? is that something you've kept exactly the same? I haven't. We haven't touched it. Yeah. I take a lot of comfort being in his room. Yeah. I don't need I don't need to be in his room to feel close to him or to no. talk to him. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it is a shrine to Jack. Yeah. Um, I'm comfortable with it being a shrine to Jack. I don't want to open his cupboards. I don't want to see his clothes. No. Yeah. His art's in there. We spent a lot of time talking on many levels and about many things in that room. So I have a personal closeness to him I can't speak for the kids and yeah. I can't speak for Emma but I take a lot of comfort being in that room yeah okay we haven't touched my dad's stuff either it's all still in his cupboards where he left it and my my dad had a signature um outfit he only ever kind of wore a white polo shirt and, <laughs> and jeans he wore that to work he wore that to his wedding I love that to his wedding to his wedding <laughs> um, that's quality and yeah my 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 dad was very much kind of carefree didn't really care what anyone thought and yeah, I, I take pride in that and yeah all the white polo shirts are still there um i actually i've never actually opened it but i know it's there if i wanted to which i think gives me comfort too yeah i think it will be quite difficult when um, we end up moving out of the house but that's not in the near future so i'm yeah. trying not to think about it but yeah it's all still there which for me is is really comforting and um heartwarming i think um it was slight, slightly different for me, and I think, well, not myself, but I know for my for my dad, and you know, I spoke about this with him, and quite soon after, not quite soon, it was a couple of months after mum's passing, um, you know, he he wanted to change the bed, and he he wanted to change a few things in the room, and you know, uh, the kids at the time, we were like, well, what the hell is he doing? Like, you know, mm. this this was devastating for us. We we're like, well, why are you doing that? Yeah, and when. Because he, he's not the best at talking about you know his emotions and things like that. But he's got great hair, your dad. He has fantastic hair, so I think I'm in good shape in the future. But um, we should yeah. get him on here. Silver Fox. In that chair. Yeah, I don't think he'd, he'd, he'd be open to that. But um, yeah, so when we did discuss it and we spoke about why what he was doing, he he said you know that the, the room reminded him of when when mum was ill and when mum was you know in bed because she couldn't move and when she was in pain. And at the time, I didn't even think of that. I was just like, oh, God. I <laughs> need to the... But um, I just, I just um, thought, like, oh, he's just trying to forget it, you know. But it, it wasn't that he was trying to forget it. It was the pain of seeing that bed. It just reminded him of all the, the, the horrible... The, the, just the pain and the destructive nature of cancer and what it did to yeah. my mum. And I think that in itself was hard for my dad so he so he needed to yeah he wanted like he wanted to remember her for the time she was dancing the time the dancing yeah. queen or the time she was laughing or, or being a teacher not her worst moments 
And yeah, like like we said before, everyone deals with it differently. So if that's your dad's way of coping, yeah. then by all means, it's just it's how he has to deal with it. So Jack has a, a very very close friend um, who, uh, like most of his closest friends, uh, are struggling, really struggling. And um, we had this discussion last week about re- remembering and they ha- they had a really tactile relationship really tactile and he said I just miss cuddling him I just miss playing with his ears I, ju- <laughs> I-, I just miss the smell of him yeah and being able to to, to just to just hold him yeah. yeah which is the sort of thing a parent would say yeah yeah but I've brought an item with me that I do I do want to share with you okay and his friend and he went through their whole school life together from the age of two yeah. to, through to when uh, he went off to America and Jack went to university in Bristol. And they were given a cardboard cutout of a star. Yeah. And they had to write a wish for their best friend. Yeah. And this is, this is the star. And what it says is, I wish that my friend Jack could stay alive forever. Wow. And he wrote that at five years it's old. Incredible. Yeah, so that's... you you use the word innate earlier, yeah. Kim. Maybe Teddy just he just knew yeah. something. He just That's amazing. He just knew something. Yeah. But I did say to Ted that Jack was um, awarded an honour at Bristol University. Yeah. He was given the award for Arda. Um, for getting through adversity because he took his degree while he was going through treatment wow. at his absolute lowest. No one would have, no one expected him to do that. Yeah, you know? that's, no. that's really, it's amazing. really amazing. And I'm going to sound like I'm boasting now, and I probably am. Please do. But I think, yeah, I think you're entitled <laughs> yeah, to go it. For it. But his tutor contacted me and said if he could have completed his degree he would have got a first in yeah. uh, maths engineering. Uh, and I said, you know something, Alan? The fact, the fact that he even sat it, yeah. let alone getting yeah. the 2-1 that he got. Yeah. And then to be given the award for Arda was a, a wonderful achievement. And then we were told that the award was renamed the Jack Morgan Award for Arda. And what I said to Teddy was, very few of us leave a mark on this earth yeah you know we're pebbles we drop in a we drop in a lake we make a ripple that ripples our life and then when the stone drops and the ripples have dissipated we're not remembered whatever the equivalent of the internet will be in 300 years somebody will receive the jack morgan award for arda yeah and they'll want to know who this who this kid was and he will leave a mark in in perpetuity which I certainly can't say for me. I disagree, but I think you've left a mark and you're a credit to Jack and Jack is a credit to you. And I think that's why I'm so grateful to be part of this conversation because, yeah, I think it's it's very important to hear what you have to say because I think I don't want to sound condescending and I don't want to sound patronising, but I think, how you're dealing with it is is really incredible. I, I thank you for that, but I'm not dealing with it prescriptively. No, of course. I, I don't think you are. I just think how you've This is this is my wiring. Yeah. I've got yeah. I've got I've got a very close friend who who's who said you're dealing with it admirably, but I'm only dealing I'm dealing with it in the only way that you know I know. I know, yeah. Yeah. I know how. Yeah. And I'm not saying that won't change because I'm sure grief is a moving feast and we'll peak and we'll trough throughout, throughout oh, yeah. our journey. Yeah. It's definitely not something that's stationary. Um, of course. I will, make, I will make you laugh, though, and I, I, I do use humour a lot. Um, and you saw that I put a video together um, on the anniversary of Jack's passing. Yeah, yeah. And I sent it to somebody he'd met through the cancer community who sent me a, a, a response saying, this is beautiful, I, I haven't heard his voice for a while. And I replied, 
that's not really a shock, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's funny you say that because, well, it, that is funny, but um, <laughs> but um, I I do I don't know why, but I also in, like obviously comedy is amazing, and you know finding humor like humor is yeah. so important. Yeah, and innately I just some I I don't know why, but I if someone says something. I do make quite uncomfortable jokes about mm. yeah. mum not being around. It's quite hard not to, yeah. given the opportunity. Yeah. You'll recall that lots of us went on to Zoom quizzes when lockdown yeah. happened. Yeah. And I was invited onto a, a, a particular Zoom quiz with lots and lots of people. And uh, one, of my, one of my son's friends was on this... Zoom quiz. Yeah. And we were messaging each other. Yeah. And I just said to him, I think Jack Morgan's having a better time at the moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he said, you can't top that. <laughs> yeah. A comedy definitely helps. I mean, I was going through a bit of a difficult patch um, last year. I had uh, some personal breakup stuff yeah. um, and do you want to talk about it with us? no, no that, <laughs> that's, that's a therapy for, session after that's all, for uh, next, week, time. next week's <laughs> podcast but um, I, I, I ended up doing a, a stand up night did Just, you? yeah oh did really? Write, that's incredible you yeah. your own comedy yeah yeah I mean I can I can send you the video um, if you guys want to watch it as well. Um, yeah, it, it I did just, not know about this. Yeah, I did, I did two nights and um, not, not to toot my own horn, but they uh, went pretty well. Well, please yeah. send it to yeah, me. Yeah, I'll send it to I've you. I've just finished writing a sitcom. Oh, really? Yeah, I've written the pilot and the storylines for the next five episodes and I'm in the middle of writing a, uh, a book. Amazing. I've written both the sitcom and the book with uh, one of my oldest and dearest friends. Um... I can't come on here and plug the book because we won't finish it until no, of course not. April. Yeah. But maybe you'll invite me back when it's finished yeah. and then I can plug the book. Yeah. But please, please I would love send to see me. That I well. love stand Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. I mean, whether or not you'll find it funny is a different story. I will story. find it funny. Um, but yeah, no, I'll, I'll send it to you for sure. Um, Thank you. Yeah. But um, yeah, well, I do want to wrap this up because I'm slightly wary of time. But again, this has been a, a fantastic chat and I think... The fact that, you know, we can sit here and discuss, as painful as it is, to sit here and discuss our passing. Um, I mean, I don't know about yourself, but it, it just leaves me with so much comfort. And, you know, this is going to be on, on, you know, the fact that this is going to be on YouTube. And I'm talking, like, my mum, you know, she wanted people talking about her. She wants people <laughs> knowing her name. The fact <laughs> this is there for the world to see and people to, to go and, you know, see my mum and what an amazing person and Jack and your father and yeah so I just again thank you for well, my thank dad, you for the... my dad would have hated it <laughs> he hated people you know knowing his business talking about well, him but to that point we we had been up until up until this point been quite a private yeah. family I, I I don't have social media no uh, I have it now to follow my my kids obviously um, is that Grant and, Laguna Grant Guna. Follow, yeah. plug, <laughs> plugging the Grant the Guna. Yeah, because I, I need to increase my following from seven to nine. Yeah, important. Uh, I'll get on yeah. that for sure. <laughs> um, but I, um, I think we all become famous for the wrong reasons. Yeah. When you join the club that we've all joined. Exclusive club as well. Yeah, it, it, it is an exclusive club and it's, it's one you don't really want to be a member no. of yeah. ever. You, you do become famous for the wrong reasons. Um, and all I'm going to say is that we always knew how brilliant our son and brother and grandson and nephew and cousin was. Now the whole world knows. Yeah. Because he documented every step on social media. And, yeah, he makes us every day very, very proud. Ken, just thank you so much yeah, for, thank for you doing this. For sharing and just being here and being giving your, us a chance yourself. to yeah, and see, you know, Jack Jack what Jack liked and yeah. Yeah, there's a lot he liked I couldn't show you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, for another podcast maybe. But anyway, thank you so thank much. You. And thank you. yeah, call that a wrap.